to day two of Transforming Transportation 2024. I am your conference MC and moderator. My name is Femi Ok. Thank you for already being seated. I don't even have to ask you to be seated. If you're online, welcome. It's so good to see you on World Bank Live. We have a hybrid conference and you online around the world are as much part of TT 2024 as anyone who's in the Preston Auditorium right now. Lean in, we're looking forward to your contribution. To do that, hashtag TTDC24 is how you communicate with us if you're online. If you're in the room, you'll see that microphone just towards the front in the aisle. When you feel a need to be part of the conversation, stand there, you will get my attention, and about 50 minutes later, I will come to you. I won't make you wait that long. Thank you so much for being with us today. Also, I have to say thank you to our lead sponsor, FedEx, and also our development partner, FIA Foundation. Without these two partners, we would not be able to be here today. So we thank both of them profusely. If you're wondering what is coming up today, I don't blame you. Wherever you see the QR scan underneath the Transforming Transportation branding, that is how you can find out what is on the agenda, more details about all of the sessions, where you need to be next. So use that QR scan. We start our conversation today with three ministers. They take us to Malawi, to Chile, to Lesotho, and really talking about their visions for resilient transportation, how they're going to get that done, really dig deep into their concrete plans, and you can also talk to them as well. Minister of Energy for Malawi, Ibrahim Matola, please come and sit in either chair number two, three, or four, your choice, thank you. Minister Juan Carlos Noz, Minister of Transport and Telecommunications for Chile, nice to see you, thank you so much. Take a seat there. And then Minister of Public Works and Transport for Lesotho, Neo Machiato Mottiani. Welcome, sir. Please take a seat. Thank you so much. Let us start. Let's we'll talk about problems. Minister, I'm sorry, you've got the short straw. You have to sit next to me, which is right here. I do apologize. Thank you so much. We often talk, ministers, about your challenges, the problems how difficult your job is. But where I would like to start is vision. And I don't know if your vision is in one year time, 10 years time, 20 years time, but your vision for resilient transport. Minister Mnuz, you start. For Chile. Thank you very much, Femi. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I think I've attended like 10 times this conference uh, and I, I love it very much since it gives us, when I was in academia, this uh, link with policymakers uh, that allow us to kind of walk with both feet. I think it was really a great experience and I'm very proud to be here now representing my country. I think now we have, of course, the, one of the main challenges of our, of, of our time. Um, and when we think about uh, transportation, to me at least, it's kind of clear that we may be too many in this in this planet, at least according to the way we have we inhabit it today. Uh, and that, of course, needs to uh, make a think on on how uh, uh, how we habitate this uh, the, 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 the the world, especially on the transportation side, which it seems to be more difficult to uh, adapt to the new uh, conditions of uh, the impact we're making in, in, in the world. Um, it seems to me that we need to be much more careful. We need to be much more uh, responsible. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to think our transport sector in terms of how do we uh, adapt? How do we uh, reduce uh, the, the, the impacts we make in, in the world in terms of emissions? Uh, and this, I, I think we have, uh, how, we need to tackle both. How do the transport sector suffer from climate change and how do we uh, uh, avoid the transport sector to cause more of the, of the climate change we are uh, observing? In terms of 
uh, of suffering, I would like to make my first call would be we need to have infrastructure that is much more resilient. Uh, I would like to m mention one little example. Last year we had we bought the, the first six super fast trains for for the country. And we were so proud. It was the most modern trains in in South America. Uh, they arrived on June, but on August we have amazing rains, rains that were above the usual isotherm. All the, the, the snow melted. So we have high rain, a very light, a high altitude, amazing floods, and six of our uh, bridges collapsed. So the trains we had bought to fight climate change and have an amazing uh, experience and to uh, enhance public transport couldn't be run yet in the whole span because our infrastructure collapsed. Uh, and that I think makes us think also on how do we uh, adapt our infrastructure in advance to prevent these things that will be happening. I mean, the floods were the highest in a century, fine. But who in this room can doubt that this will happen again soon? Because the weather is changing, the climate is changing. So the first thing here is we need to take a look at our infrastructure uh, and to make it more resilient to this kind of events. The second element, I think, when we think of how, how do we make our transport system, sec sector be less responsible of the climate change we're observing, I think is urban density. Uh, it's very impressive when you compare cities. I mean, we in this uh, room, probably many of us have been able to visit many, many different cities. And it's so evident when you see a city that the transport footprint is obviously much smaller than others. And it has to do, in my opinion, with urban density. You visit Hong Kong, and I'm not sure we all want to live in a city like Hong Kong, but the, the urban the, the footprint that you see there is, of course, much smaller than in a city like this one or mine. Uh, so I, I think we need to uh, consider uh, and try to um, emphasize that urban sprawl is no longer okay, I think. Uh, and that's something that we need to fight, that we need to uh, uh, put it very high in our, in our agendas. Um, it, it also makes, of course, uh, transport sector, the transportation uh, of uh, services much, much cheaper, much more affordable for the government, for people. So uh, it's clear, in my opinion, that that's the second challenge we need to do. Third one would be, I think, affordability and convenience. How do, make, we, do we make public transport more affordable, more convenient? In our country, we have moved ahead with a, we think we're proud of a program where we have made, uh, given a cap of the money you, that somebody will pay uh, for public transport in a month if they use a QR code. And we're very happy that or more and more people are using it and enjoying it and having like seven, 10 day trips free per month. And of course, when you know that you will reach the limit, you perceive that all your trips are free in the month, all of them, not only the number 31. Because if you know that the number 31 is going to be free, when, in one sense, you feel that any extra trip you make in the, the, along the whole month is free for you. Uh, and that's something we we're doing and we want to probably enhance. And finally, I think for this, especially for this room, I think a final comment is that we need to not to be fell in love with that specific transport mode. I think we need to understand transportation as a system uh, and we need to design them and operate them in a way that we take advantage of them as, a, as such, as a system. So I think that all the connections between bikes and trains and buses and taxis and cars, I think are relevant. Minister Matola from Malawi, your vision for resilient transport. Take us into it, describe it. Thank you very much. I'll start by saying, Sabah al khair, bonjour, como ça va? Hola, jambo, bon dia. And now we have no more time left for the session. <laughs> But we, we appreciate you welcoming us in so many languages. <laughs> You're a Ministry of Energy. Are you stalling for time here, Minister? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm very glad that I'm talking 
to the right audience. The decision makers in terms of finance, the World Bank, and the, the world at large. Malawi is a land-linked country in the east, bordering Mozambique. In the west, bordering Zambia. And in the north, bordering Tanzania. Issues of energy and transport intertwining. You cannot separate them. It is an issue of a chicken and egg. Let me start by quoting an African proverb, which says, a cat that dreams of becoming a lion must start losing the appetite of rats. <laughs> End of quote. We are here discussing about the future of the future generations. Malawi has got a blueprint, the one which we call Malawi 2063 agenda, in support with the African Union agenda. If the World Bank wants to walk alone, it won't work. This is the time where we need also to look into the African proverb which says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others, end of quote. This is the time where we need to walk together. Don't leave us behind. As a continent, take us as partners in the development of this world. Africa has got abundant resources. Everything what we're talking here, the past two days, the resources are in Africa. But we are taken as a dumping site. Time has come where a one hand cannot clap. In Swahili, they say, Kidole Kimoja, Akivunji Wacha, Chawa. We need each other. In order for us to fulfill these agendas, we need your support. And the support which we are looking for is finance without conditionalities attached to the way you give money for democracy. For democracy, there is no conditionalities attached to. But when it comes for infrastructure, you give us a lot of pages with conditionalities attached to and to fulfill. And the end results, you label us as a risk country where you cannot invest. The investment in Africa is very, very important. Africa first should be given an opportunity to change the curriculum. Where our schools, we are still teaching them who discovered Africa, Vasco da Gama, Galileo, who discovered the river Niger, how many parts are in frog, if you basket a frog, change should come. When you look at China, India, 20 years ago, we were together at the same level. We're not developed. But because our friends invested a lot in education, science, innovation, I'll give you a story of a Malawian who harnessed the wind. And he was taken. He's somewhere here in America. He think, harnessed wind. I think he's in Maryland. Thank you very much. Yeah. These are the things which African were born natural engineers, natural innovators. What we need is just support. And that support should come from the bank without conditionalities. If you don't support us, we'll follow you. Every day, an African child, nine out of 10 are dying crossing the Mediterranean Sea, going into Europe, looking for future and green 
pastors. We'll follow you wherever you are. For that not to be done, we need to invest a lot in Africa because Malawi in the 80s were manufacturing batteries. Malawi in the 80s, we had canary. Where a farmer, just in the doorstep, he can sell his pineapples, his bananas. But today, because of the structural adjustments which were imposed, we lost everything. And a farmer to take his goods or her goods from the farm to the selling point, it takes ages. And the end results, the broken system of our transportation, they end up losing the whole produce. And next year, you won't have appetite of growing pineapples, growing avocado, because the industries are not there. Value addition. We need also to be given an opportunity to have our industries. And these industries can only take place when we have power. You will sponsor us with a lot of vaccines and we end up with those vaccines not reaching to the intended people. And we end up disposing them in order to please you on a campaign of vaccinating everybody, whether he or she is not sick. What we need is to have power and the transport to take those vaccines to the rural areas. The majority of Malawians are living in the rural area. For them to have equal opportunities on resilient transportation and also energy, we need to give them what they are supposed to, equal opportunities sustainable, reliable, affordable transport. Malawi spends a lot of money, almost half a billion of US dollars on fossil fuel. This is the time we're talking, planning about the future of e-mobility. It is a welcome development, but we need to move together in order to transit in this journey. However, as Malawian government, led by His Excellency, the State President, Dr. Lazarus Makata Chakwera, we have tried to review some of the laws. There are some which are non-legislative reforms and legislative reforms. We need more support so that these reforms can fit in with the new technologies which are just coming in. The participation of private sector, His Excellency's administration has tried to accommodate the private sector, whether in the energy and also in the transportation. But what we need is to have all this incorporated into our systems to review, and we need that money today, I hope, as I said that I'm speaking to the right audience, I hope when I'm leaving this conference, I will come out with a blank check. <laughs> <laughs> so that these things should start tomorrow. We mustn't delay you to develop this world. We are trying to build the future of our generations and generations to come. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. I, I was not taught how to swim, but most of us who are here, we spend millions of dollars in order to be taught how to swim. African child is so blessed by having skills even to make a car. I drove a car even if without knowing or seeing it, but I made it from the wires or from the clay. So African child needs just capacity building and also to review our laws so that they can fit in the new technologies which are coming. The vision of His Excellency, Dr. Rasa Sumakata Chakwera, is to move together with the world. And by the way, Malawi has 
its energy resources from clean energy, hydro. We depend on hydro and also solar. What we need is bring your investment and don't take Africa or Malawi as the, the whole continent, which is the, uh, a fragile state. They are some, yes, in the continent, but don't label the continent of Africa or countries in the states in Africa as a whole state that which is fragile. I thank you and you're most welcome to come and invest in Malawi. That is an epic vision. <laughs> Thank you. We will keep in touch to see when you leave the World Bank headquarters, what you leave with. <laughs> Hope, maybe. Thank you, Minister. Minister Modiani, um, I'd really like to hear, we would really love to hear your vision for the Sutu regarding resilient transportation mm -hmm. and also transportation that impacts everybody's lives. Thank you. Uh, after, after the Honorable Minister, it is clear why we're here. So if you, if you, if you give him the check, just give me a smaller one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. I think maybe just to put it in context again, where we come from, where we, where we sit, as I was on the stage here yesterday and explained that we are um, a landlocked country, which is enclaved, which means it is, it is totally enclaved by another state, which is the Republic of South Africa. That limits our options, that limits our outlook in some ways. Uh, but and being a small state, we are 200, two, two million, two million in population. The choices for small states appear to be that one, if you want to industrialize, if you want to develop, you have limitations, the usual limitations, the size of the population, the market, all those things. So you have no option but to look outside. And you have no option but to ensure that you are well connected to the outside. So we, we are big on connectivity. We are big on connectivity to our neighbor as well as beyond through some of his uh, networks or her networks. And uh, we need as a, as a country to get in a very cost efficient manner to the various ports so that we can uh, uh, export our goods from there. That's a big priority for us. That's what we, are, we need to work on. Of course, in order to achieve that, one needs to have an internal network of connectivity that is working to connect various towns and cities to one another. And in that regard, I think we've made a lot of progress with various uh, development partners, including the World Bank. We are at a stage where we estimate that within uh, the next five years or so, we will have our desired national network of roads in order for us to connect better within ourselves. Then what we need to do is from our, I mean, Lesotho has done relative to what it can do has invested quite significantly in this regard. The challenge for us, I know you're looking for a vision, not for a challenge. Uh, the challenge for us is now to ensure we work with our neighbor, to ensure that from our borders up to uh, points of exports, the movement of trade is, is smooth. So we are looking at regional integration in that regard. Uh, most Southern African countries uh, have got different corridors being developed. 
we are working on our corridor uh, to connect uh, the Dragonsbeck Transfrontier uh, Corridor and to do some work on that. And we are looking at that with the bank currently to have a component of that. We don't, we don't deal with big numbers, luckily. Uh, so I'll express my numbers in percentage terms. Uh, we, are, we are working towards a, a strategic plan that says as far as roads are concerned, we, st we need to do 25% of the road network. We have the, the national grid, the primary one, in order to get to where we need. But what's a challenge for Lesotho is there's no point doing these roads if we lose the investments you make, like my, like you are in, in Chile, because of weather, because of inclement weather conditions. So we need to improve, and we have worked at improving our resilience in order to be able to achieve that. We also need to attract movement of logistics through our country from one end of our neighbor to the other end through our country. How are we going to achieve that? We need to understand that to continue the narrative of looking at a road network in terms of cost per kilometer, while that is important, what we really need to do, what does it do in a climate, from a climate uh, action perspective? We have a project on the table where we can cut on one of the networks in South Africa about 300 kilometers if we directed their national network through our country. The benefit of that is not just that the, the routes are shorter, we must make just sure that as well that a lot of efficiency is 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 achieved through through in that way. So those are the areas as Lesotho we are looking at. We have a we are looking at it in terms of five years uh, to get the basic planning right. I think I'll stop at the station. Okay. If you would like to talk to the minister from Chile, from Malawi, from Lesotho, now is your opportunity to do it in this room. Please stand behind that microphone. Let me just check in to see what is happening online. Do we have any feedback online? No, they are listening. They are fascinated. Yeah, but not commenting. Well, there is interesting amendment. Uh, uh, people are very excited about the conversation, but not really a lot of questions, more uh, assertions. So thank you. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, Minister Munoz, when. Oh, okay. Go, yeah. go ahead, please. I'm Tony Lindo from WRI, mm -hmm. Brazil. I'd like to ask a question to Minister Juan Carlos, who okay. happens to be a great friend. I mean, he is a very has a very solid academic background, was leading one of the key research institutions in, in transportation in the world. And now he is in the other side of the balcony there leading as a minister. So I'd like to have some sort of a reflections on, on your hopes and all the things you want still to do because you, I think, midterm or, or about that. So how how is, I mean, how are you feeling in that situation? And, and do you think this will be really helpful. I mean, all this background, a solid background you have into transitioning from theory to practice. <laughs> easy one. Yeah, very easy, Tony. Yeah? Uh, I think, uh, I think that I will make a parallel. When, we, when I used to run uh, more than once, an interdisciplinary research center, as maybe some there may be some academic here, there were usually very clear uh, distances between different disciplines, where you would say there are some 
uh, disciplines that would address this problem in some way and another one in another. And the strength of the, of the academic center was to have them working together, discussing together, and approaching problems more integrally. My perception in these two years as minister, or my kind of pain, is that I feel like the government is also very fragmented. And it's very difficult for a minister of a specific topic to insinuate that a different minister, let's say housing, in my case, public works, uh, energy, environment, should be, should be doing things differently because my perception or my vision tells otherwise. So it seems to me that within government, we need to um, formalize, institutionalize more this intersectoral approach to problems because the problems, the challenging problems we're dealing with are no, are no longer which technology will we choose for the train or how many houses will we build, but more like the re really the approach for, as I said before, urban density. Isn't that a very complicated problem that doesn't lie in one specific sector? And the problem we have is that you have these several horses speeding up as much as they can with very specific uh, targets on how many houses are you going to build, how many passengers will you take in your public transport system, how many millions of dollars will you invest in terms of public works. And the, the incentives are no, not really to stop, to talk, and to take wiser decisions, in my opinion. Uh, and the problem is, is most, most likely if you do, the benefits will not be observed in your term. So I'm not sure that the incentives we have or the, uh, takes us towards this common table in which the question is, how should the city be structured? And how do we address those very difficult and harmful law Short, harmful decisions in the long, in the short term, that will give us a lot of benefits in the long term. Uh, it seems to me that we we may need more an intersectoral approach. That at least we have the committees, huh? but still we enter the committee with a very clear badge. I'm the transportation person. I'm the housing person. I'm the public work person, and I think that needs to be in some way. Uh, tackled so that these more uh, clear problems are addressed adequately. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Joseph Mende and I come from Liberia and I work for Radars for Health. We use motorcycle to transport health products and specimen from the health facilities or laboratory for rapid diagnosis. Uh, my uh, first point is uh, I would like to commend our speakers and the organizer for having me here today. Uh, firstly, I'm looking in the room and I'm still thinking, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's a direct representation of the African Union or ECOWAS in this room. Uh, this question comes to mind because considering the global platform that we are about to build in transforming transportation, Africa has a very big stick into this transformation, this process, or these processes. With the minister or uh, speech that he just made or his comment, I would like to recommend that harnessing the resources, especially the level of brains and experiences in this room. I think it will be good if we can encourage our African partners to be a part of this transformation decision-making processes. Joseph, thank you for your recommendation. Did you have a question? I'm gonna leave it with your recommendation. We're also going to be hearing from in just a moment, the VP for Eastern and Southern Africa at the World Bank. So definitely Africa is in this room. Joseph, thank you. Uh, if you see Joseph during the coffee break, he will show you the pictures of this uh, remarkable way of transporting um, 
goods and medicines around Liberia. If you've been to Liberia, the road system is not the best. It's quite challenging. And those motorbikes are the ways to get around. Joseph has on his phone that system. So have a, have a listen and have a look uh, when you get a chance in the coffee break. Yes, please, last question. Hi, uh, thank you so much. My name is Ryan Sklar. I'm with NG Impact, formerly WRI. Um, my question is pretty simple. If you did leave with a blank check, what's the first and most impactful thing you'd want to do with the money? And I'd appreciate maybe a very quick response from all three of the panelists. Could even just be a sentence or maybe even just a word. Uh, let's start with the with the minister who asked for the, who asked for the blank check. And let me just remind you, Minister, that everybody laughed when you asked for that blank check. It might have been nervous laughter, but I like the question very much. Go ahead. What would you do with the money? First, as the I highlighted the challenges which we are facing in terms of transportation and the energy issues in the country, Malawi. We need to put things in order. When we are talking about transportation, let's look at our road network. And there is also a roadmap for Africa Union connecting from Cape to Cairo. But is it real? With the demarcations which are there and different targets and different working hours within the member states. If we can invest first in the energy. Like what my president said on the 9th of February when he was speaking to the nation and the world at large, that the first priority in the energy sector is to add more power to the grid. So Ms. Minister Matolo, as we're coming to the end of this session, I'm going to say, so you're gonna put the money to a road network. Because remember, this is an imaginary blank check. So I'm going to move on quite swiftly. Thank you. Yes, uh, as we are going towards the the road net uh, the road network, road but network. also electric e mobility, we need to have more power. All right. Uh, obviously, journalism cynicism saying imaginary blank check. I do not know. The day is still young. Minister Matiani, what would you do with finances investment that was inspired by TT twenty twenty four? Right. If I, if I did get a blank check, I'd write a figure on it. Uh, and the figure would be about $3 billion on the road network. And that would be resilient. That would be co comprehensive. And that would connect the country sufficiently. Mm. The second thing I would do is to ask for the next check and the next chair could be to transform Lesotho's potential in hydro to a degree that it can become a significant player in the production of carbon-free fuel, in particular hydrogen. Do you want to know what I would do with the third check? The last thing I would do is also to transform Lesotho's economy to a true energy, green energy production. No hybrid, just go straight for that because that's, what we, that's all we can do at this point in time. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna call this potential investment from TT24, Minister Munoz. Thank you, Femi. Um, it's very, in our case, we have moved ahead very fast with the electromobility agenda. I'm very proud. We're, we can tell that Santiago de Chile is the city in the world with more electric buses outside from China. It's 2,500 buses, electric buses. It's really impressive and it's changing the way uh, our city moves. Uh, our, one first inclination is to say we would move ahead with that agenda faster and probably make it happen not only in Santiago, but in the rest of the country. 
but I think that we need to move a little bit out of the question of, of the system to answer the question uh, and understand that even though yeah electromobility is relevant because it allows us to reduce emissions and emissions is the main challenge we have I think mm. the emissions are not only depending on the transport mode we use but also I think the distance we travel the number of trips we make per day the energy needed per transport mode. So I would put some of the money in making our city more compact. I would pay, put some of the, the money on putting public housing on higher density in well-located places. I would put some of the money on good jobs near to where people live. Let me tell you one little story. Minister Manus. It's the very short story in about 30 seconds. Is that possible? Yeah. Fantastic. We have, as probably most of your countries, a lot of male drivers, bus drivers, and very rarely a female driver. We have made a systematic effort in asking our bus companies to hire women. And for them, it has become an amazing opportunity for, to find a formal job. Not only find it, but also close to where they live bus terminals are in the periphery. So we need to put some of the jobs closer where to where people live, and that will also allow to reduce our carbon footprint. So I think we need to take, it's, electromobility is great, and we feel so proud, trains are amazing, but we need to address the problem rigorously and from a broader perspective, I think. Mm. What I hear here is not imagination for a blank check. I hear purpose, commitment, concrete plans when you have the investment. Nobody even missed a beat in terms of what would you do with more investment. Ministers, we thank you so much for spending time on the TT stage today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, I, I, I think we can take a, uh, a group photo here. Oh yes, please, please, uh, please take a group, please take a group photograph with, 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 with me. Okay, all right. I was going to continue with the program, but I am being commanded by a minister who has so many quotes about Africa. I have to actually pose. All right. Together we can. All right, We're together well. we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is good trouble right here. Good trouble. Excellent. All right. Thank you, ministers. Do take your, your belongings with you as we move on with our program today. Victoria Kwakwa is the vice president of Eastern and Southern Africa for the World Bank. When I asked Victoria about what is the headline for what you're going to deliver as your keynote for us today. Victoria said, possibilities and partnerships. Victoria, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Femi. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with this august audience at uh, TT24. I hear this is the 21st edition of it. So congratulations to all of you for keeping this going. Clearly it's, it's, it's worth uh, the money and it's worth the time that all of you put in here. Uh, so thank you all for being here and thank you uh, to the organizers for giving me a chance uh, to give this uh, keynote uh, address. I'd like also to thank the ministers uh, for their panel. I enjoyed listening to you and hearing about your vision and some of what you would do with your blank checks. Anyway, uh, to our topic of this morning. You know, I think we're all here because we recognize that transport plays a key role in driving economic growth and fostering development by supporting the creation of jobs and connecting people to economic opportunities and services. Yet we also know that the way people and goods circulate contributes significantly to climate change, 
accounting for 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is growing faster than any other sector except industry. We know that climate hazards are also affecting every aspect of the transport value chain. So there's an urgent need to rethink the way transport infrastructure and services are developed to mitigate and reduce their impact on climate change and ensure resilience to guarantee everyone has access to safe, efficient, and affordable transport with a smaller climate footprint. First and foremost, resilient and sustainable transport systems are critical to tackle the development challenges developing countries face. Climate-related disasters disproportionately impact the poor. Over the past 50 years, Climate-related disasters have caused more than 800,000 fatalities and over $1 trillion in economic loss. And marginalized communities are disproportionately bearing the impact of climate change and natural hazards, especially in lower income countries. In Sub-Saharan Africa, approximately 90% of disasters and weather and climate-driven are climate driven and by 2030 up to 118 million extremely poor people on the continent living on less than a dollar a day a dollar 25 a day will be exposed to climate hazards these are huge numbers that we're talking about developing climate resilient transport systems not only pieces of infrastructure to increase access to social and economic opportunities, to address food crisis, vulnerability and fragility situations is therefore an obligation, especially in our work in Africa. The multifaceted crisis faced in the last years have significantly upended the transport sector and taught us that improving the resilience and efficiency of the global transport and logistics systems is crucial to better adapt to changing global circumstances and emerging crises, to fight rising food insecurity, to address situations of fragility and security. This is especially true in the poorest countries. Investing in climate resilient infrastructure systems provides also significant socio-economic benefits to other sectors. The development and improvement of all year passable rural roads in Sub-Saharan Africa has spillover benefits to agriculture systems and public services such as healthcare and education. This is evident all across Africa, but also in other parts of the world. For example, in rural Morocco, the enrollment of girls in primary schools surged from 17% to 54% when their access to roads improved. Climate resilient transport systems are crucial for sustainable development. Investing in transport systems and transport system resilience reduces the adverse impacts of climate change and natural hazards on economies. It avoids large costly infrastructure repairs and minimizes the wide ranging consequences on people's well-being, especially on the well-being of vulnerable groups. The extra cost of building resilience into infrastructure systems brings substantial savings in maintenance and repair and reduces disruptions to the economy. Universal access to affordable and reliable infrastructure services support strong economic growth and high productivity and promotes distributive equity. But by climate resilient transport systems, I'm not just referring to climate resilience of specific transport assets, a road or a railway link, for example, or even climate resilience of a transport network. I'm referring to a system that has end users in mind, 
a system that addresses the climate resilience of transport throughout its entire life cycle, starting with planning, through engineering and design, investment, operations and maintenance, institutional capacity and coordination, and ending with contingency planning, including early warning signals and post-disaster recovery, such as insurance. Such systems are lacking in Africa and in other parts of the developing world and will take time to implement. The World Bank is starting to work with a few countries to help build these systems. Implementing climate resilient infrastructure investment is costly and will require significant contributions from the international community. It is therefore important for high income countries to start balancing climate support between mitigation and adaptation. Beyond adaptation, shifting to low carbon and greener transportation modes represents a huge opportunity for developing countries, notably in Africa, especially on two fronts, urban mobility, which uh, has been mentioned already, and greener logistics. On urban mobility, shifting to more efficient modes of urban transport is indeed a fantastic opportunity for developing countries. African cities, notably, to leapfrog and avoid being locked in a car-centric development. Sub-Saharan Africa is the lowest contributor to global carbon emissions by far. Yet while motorization rates are low, most cities are congested with old and unsafe vehicles polluting people's lives and not providing efficient and safe transport, especially for women, for children, and for the elderly. With the majority of city population still walking and using some form of public transport, this presents an opportunity to avoid a car-centric development and promoting instead efficient, affordable, and inclusive modes of transportation and more livable cities. I'd like to highlight three promising agendas. The BRT agenda, active mobility, and e-mobility. BRT, the bus rapid transit, with buses running on segregated lanes, offer advantages similar to metro systems, but at a significantly lower cost. They significantly reduce congestion, pollution, and GHG emissions, while meeting the growing mobility demand and improving access to jobs. To jobs. The BRT in Dakar, for example, the first fully electric BRT in Africa will have a positive impact on air quality by encouraging the use of public transportation and shifting to a full electric fleet. 1.8 million tons in GHG emission savings are expected over 30 years, roughly the equivalent of getting 260,000 cars off the road while providing an affordable, convenient, and safe mode of transportation for more than 300,000 passengers daily. Other cities are following, in, are following in the same direction. In Dar es Salaam, for example, which will soon have the largest BRT network across sub-Saharan African cities, with one line in operation, three under construction, and two more planned, Electrification is actively being pursued as the network expansion takes place. Active mobility, walking and biking maximizes the social economic benefits of investing in low carbon emitting transport infrastructure. Investments in pedestrian and cycling infrastructure coupled with complementary education and training programs foster access to jobs and essential services, especially when integrated with public transport networks. Cycling is also a quick to implement, a quick to implement strategy with shorter implementation timelines compared to metro or BRT projects. In Addis Ababa, 
and most cities in Ethiopia, walking and cycling are primary means of transport. And in 2020, the Ethiopian Ministry of Transport and Logistics launched a 10-year non-motorized transport strategy aimed at institutionalizing a more equitable access to transport, most often used by Ethiopians while addressing the country's objective to reduce GHG emissions by 64% by 2030. A World Bank finance project, Transport Systems Improvement Project, served as an entry point to support the shift to more active, safe, and affordable means of transportation in Ethiopia. Transition to e-mobility is also an an opportunity Sub-Saharan Africa is starting to rapidly embrace for transport decarbonization. A recent flagship report that the World Bank produced shows that the electrification of transport can be, can be constructive, cost-effective, and financially sustainable in developing countries, notably for e-buses and two- and three-wheelers. The potential benefits of electric mobility for low- and middle-income countries go well beyond decarbonization to include promoting inclusive mobility, improving local air quality, bolstering energy security, and democratizing manufacturing. Examples of development of whole value chains of e-vehicles can be seen in Kenya, in Uganda, and Rwanda. On green logistics, shifting freight traffic to lower emissions modes of transport is crucial to address the adverse impacts of transport logistics on the environment and people's health, while meeting the rising demand for logistics activities in developing country. countries. Freight transport and logistics is a critical enabler of economic and social development. The demand for logistics activity is expected to rise as lower middle-income countries grow. Under business as usual conditions, that growth will lead to substantial increases in GHG emissions. Therefore, decoupling the growth in logistics activity from the growth in GHG emissions is urgently needed. Switching to greener logistics can be done by using greener and more energy efficient transport modes, optimizing transport routes and investing in alternative fuel technologies, such as hydrogen fuel cells and renewable natural gas. In East Africa, the Central Corridor, a multimodal logistics corridor linking five landlocked countries of the Great Lakes region with the port of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania is critical towards improving improved regional integration as one of the ministers mentioned the government of Tanzania is upgrading the port for additional throughput as well as the existing railway line and is constructing a new higher speed railway line to support modal shift from the very congested corridor road as lower carbon alternative with the existing railway line focusing on bulky cargo, the new railway on container traffic. The World Bank Group is ready to support countries in scaling up financing for sustainable and climate resilient transport infrastructure with objectives to address both climate adaptation and climate mitigation equally. The financing needs faced by governments and cities to transition to low carbon and resilient transport infrastructure are enormous, as you all know. An estimated $93 trillion of of sustainable infrastructure needs to be built by 2030. For sub-Saharan African countries, the World Bank estimates the need for investment to be equal to 7% of their GDP annually in SDG-related infrastructure when they have only been investing 3.5% of GDP due to lack of available financial resources. The needs are fiercer in cities which which represent 50% of the world's population, but account for 70% of global CO2 emissions. 
Although urbanization is a driver of growth, unplanned and rapid urbanization can contribute to increasing greenhouse gas emissions and vulnerability to shocks. Local governments and cities are eager to take steps to become low carbon and climate resilient, but they're facing challenges to adequately plan and prepare for these projects due to insufficient capacity and resources. And local governments also face challenges to access funding. The World Bank is committed to support countries in scaling finance for both climate adaptation and mitigation. And the bank is already the largest pro pro uh, provider of financing for transport globally. Since 2017, the transport global practice has committed about $14.9 billion in low carbon and climate resilient actions through 177 projects. 40% of these actions are for Sub-Saharan Africa, where they amount to $6 billion through 70 projects. We can do more and we will do more as announced uh, at COP28 by our World Bank uh, president, who set an ambitious objective to devote 45% of annual financing of the World Bank to climate rela related projects. The transport sector has a big role to play in delivering on this, but the World Bank cannot do it alone. And we need support from all partnerships, as Femi mentioned. The World Bank is at the forefront of solutions to mobilize financing for sustainable and resilient transport infrastructure. The funding gap for infrastructure in developing countries is substantial and exceeds the capabilities of governments alone. Mobilizing private capital and other partners is therefore essential. The transport sector presents significant opportunities for private capital investment. A few examples. Private capital mobilization and mass transit systems. The Dakar BRT project, for instance, received support from various entities, including the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, IFC, MEGA, the government, and the private sector. Financing of the BRT electric buses indeed mobilized 144 million in private, 144 million dollars in private sector funding facilitated through a public-private partnership supported by IFC. Private capital mobilization in multimodal top corridors as the market for green minerals grows rapidly, implement, as the market for green minerals grows rapidly. Implementing multimodal corridors, often critical for food security, will require capital intensive investments and offer huge opportunities for private capital mobilization in a context of rapidly rising global demand for green minerals. The World Bank is committed to supporting the governments in creating the enabling environment to attract this private capital. And MEGA and World Bank joint efforts to fund climate resilient roads in Kenya is another example. In the past two years, MEGA has provided over $186 million in guarantees to assist the Kenyan government in attracting crucial foreign investment for its extensive road enhancement scheme. This program is set to refurbish 10,000 kilometers of roads, which will not only double the asphalt surfaced roads in the country, but also have many journey, many journey times within the East African nation. Additionally, the program is designed with climate adaptation features, such as the installation of more substantial and expansive drains, pipes, and culverts. In closing, the World Bank is committed to scaling finance for low carbon and resilient transport systems in developing countries. Mobilization of all international finance institutions, the private sector, high income countries will be critical to meet the dire financing needs. And we believe this effort should tackle both climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. We stand ready to lead this collective effort. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. 
I'd now like to give the floor to our senior managing director, Mr. Axel von Trotzenberg, who unfortunately can't be here uh, today, but he recognizes the importance of what all of you are doing here. And so is joining through a video, uh, a short video that will be presented right away. Thank you very much. Colleagues, partners, ministers, and guests, hello. Thank you for joining us for Transforming Transportation. Although I can't be with you in person, I wanted to share my thoughts about the crucial links between transport and resilience. The world is facing a myriad of challenges right now. Climate change, natural disaster, food insecurity, and others, all of which threaten our development goals. Transport is central to overcoming all these challenges, especially in three particular ways. First, globally natural hazards cost $15 billion in direct damages to transport infrastructure every year. And roads, bridges, railways, or public transit system we build today must be able to withstand the intensifying climate risk of tomorrow. At the World Bank, we are responding by promoting climate-proof transport infrastructure. A few weeks ago, our board approved a $452 million financing for the Assam Resilient Rural Bridges Program, which will repair and ensure the climate resilience of more than a thousand bridges that connect over 1.8 million people across over 1,700 villages in rural India. Second, resilient transport provides continuity in the wake of disasters, ensuring that people in vulnerable places have consistent access to the supplies and services they need even in a crisis. Our work on resilient transport infrastructure in the Pacific Islands is a testament to this. Upgraded roads and seawalls help life to go on even when climate change throws people on the coastlines curveballs after curveball. And finally, resilient transport is the engine that keeps the global economy running. Recent events have demonstrated just how important well-functioning ports and supply chains are to global markets. Major gaps remain in this area. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, transport costs can represent up to 50% of food prices and over a third of the food produced in Africa is lost due to poor logistics. At the World Bank, we are committed to ensuring resilience in transport projects throughout their life cycles, including design, construction, maintenance, and of course, also governance. We are also determined to reduce the carbon footprint of transport by promoting cleaner mobility alternatives such as public transport. There are ample opportunities to develop climate smart transport projects that reduce the sector's contribution to climate change while becoming more resilient to it. A good example is the Quito Metro, which started operating a few months ago. The new Metro will save hundreds of thousands of greenhouse gas emissions while bringing 780,000 jobs within the reach of commuters. Financing this transformation require multifaceted partnerships. As emphasized in our evolution roadmap, the World Bank is putting greater focus on leveraging our balance sheet to catalyze action and financing from more partners. Public-private partnerships and financial innovations will be crucial in boosting investment in sustainable transport. The World Bank's Global Road Safety Facility and the Global Facility to Decarbonize Transport are at the leading edge of these efforts. In closing, I want to encourage all of you to focus your efforts this week on generating new ideas for transforming transportation into a resilient, sustainable force for development. I have no doubt that our collective expertise will lead to practical solutions that make a real difference. Have a great conference and thank you.
Our next plenary is resilient transport in challenging times. You will need an interpretation device or you may need one for this session. I am making a public service announcement for the Preston Auditorium. We have lost three interpretation devices. They are worth a lot of money. I'm in trouble. If you have one in your bag or you took one to another room or you accidentally took it home, come to me, Chatham House Rules. I will not tell anybody that you took it. Just bring it back. That would be great. Thank you. I know it's easy to do, but if it ended up somewhere else, on a desk somewhere, retrace your steps, bring it back. And of course, at the end of this session, please do not take the interpretation devices out of this room. Now I'm going to stop being the headmistress and introduce this next session and the speakers in the session. Dr. Sissy Nicolau, hello. Please join us on the stage. The very far chair is the group leader at the US National Institute of Technology and Standards. Christine Galachian is Deputy Minister of Territorial Administration and Infrastructure of the Republic of Armenia. Welcome. Maria Constanza Garcia Alacastro is the Deputy Minister of Infrastructure at the Ministry of Transport in Colombia. Please take a seat. Dr. Siti Maimuna, welcome. Good morning. Please take a seat. Head of Center of Transportation, Infrastructure Financing, Indonesian Ministry of Transportation. And Maria Luisa Dominguez is Strategic Plans and Projects Director and Advisor to the Board of the ADIF and President of EIM in Spain. Thank you so much, speakers. Looking forward to the conversation. And our keynote will be presented by Dr. Jürgen Voigele, who is the Vice President of the World Bank. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. To those of you online, you know, I'm a little, I left my speech on my chair because it overlaps to 90% with what you've heard from a very comprehensive uh, presentation by Victoria. I think it's clear what the challenge is. I think it's also clear, more clear in transport than in many other sectors, what the opportunities are. It's in front of us. It's not that we have to reinvent it. We know what the future transport that is low carbon, low impact, really works for the people can look like. And we are on a journey to get there. I think the key challenge for us is to do it faster. That is what's really concerning. I be really feeling now, everyone in this room and everyone around the world is feeling climate is changing faster than even the most conservative scientists predicted and projected. It's happening around us at a speed that we did not anticipate. And it's gonna get worse fast. That's clearly what, where we are. And infrastructure is being impacted at a, to a massive extent. We know the damages are huge already. It's in the mega billions. Um, and it's gonna get accelerated. We will not be able, the way things look like, to keep this planet's temperature increase below 1.5 degrees. This is a reality that we are facing. Last year was already at 1.5 above pre-industrial times. It's an illusion to think, even if we do everything different and look at the politics around the world, how likely is that going to happen? It will be very, very challenging to stay below two degrees. At two degrees, all bets are off what the implications are for a sector like transport with its massive infrastructure that's been built up over many, many decades. So we need to find a way to get to speed and we need to get the scale and we need to get to impact. I, this has been said before, I know, but I think the urgency and the clarity that, that's in front of us is just striking. We need to do things differently. So I want to build a little bit on what the previous panel sort of articulated. I think it was the minister uh, from Chile and the minister from um, uh, Lesotho kind of saying, you know, we kind of know what to do, but we, we are too slow. We're not getting there. And what we really need to do is get out of our silo because it isn't just about the transport silo and the transport folks. It's connected to everything else that's going on around us. You can't have sustainable transport without electricity. One of you made the point and that electricity cannot be 
based on fossil fuels going forward over time. So we need to work together on that aspect. It is the food security challenge that many countries are facing. You cannot have food security without logistics and without infrastructure. It's been said before. But I think it's very, very important to make these, to, to really understand and analyze country by country how the scenario around us is changing and shifting. I spoke at a similar event a couple of weeks ago in, with relation to water. As a result of the changing climate, we now understand that our planet is drying up. It is not only groundwater recession, it is not only that the intensity of the storms, floods and droughts are going up, the planet itself, the soil moisture on the planet is 15% lower today than it was in the past few, in a few decades, and it's going in the wrong direction. So everything a country does in water isn't a project or isn't just another study or isn't just another investment. Everyone has to fundamentally take a step or two back and rethink the way you manage your water going forward. What, is, what do you need to prioritize, which is the, the topic of the day, because funding is limited, as we all know. You've got to find a clear way how you prioritize. And your assumptions that you carried with you for a long time, and I'm sure that's the same in transport, no longer necessarily hold. You have to rethink it. You have to take a step back and say, OK, in the next 20 or 30 years, that's what I'm going to face. Therefore, the infrastructure in this place will be more important than we, we thought 10 years ago. So these kind of analytics and studies are absolutely fundamental. And they need to be done in every sector. And they need to be done jointly, not individually, separately, and then comparing notes and then realizing, actually, you know, we're talking past each other. This is true in countries. And thank you, Minister, for making this clear. It's also true in here in this institution, in, in, in the World Bank, in, and I think in many other institutions as well. So Guanzi and I, we, we speak regularly in the intersection of climate, water, energy, all the other factors that inf impact infrastructure broadly, and particularly transport as well. Is it really that expensive uh, to do this right? Actually, maybe not. Uh, our study have shown that to make infrastructure, and particularly transport, more resilient, is in the range of one to five percent of the cost. It's not twice. It's not double. It's it's not completely unreasonable if it's if it's done deliberately and and if the analytics are clear. Why is it still not happening? Because we don't really have the data in many parts of the world to understand what it takes, what the costs are, what is the priority. So this is a really important part of prioritization to get clear of what what is more um, at risk what is more likely to be achieved, where is it more cost effective to do. So these sorts of things are really important. There's tech, technical cap capacity issues in countries. That is also the case, but it's not, I don't think, the major constraint. And then the, the question is, why doesn't the private sector do more of it? And again, this is because they're not clear what the real benefits are of a more resilient road, for instance. But it's also harder to sell something, even if it's 5% more expensive, it's harder to get the money for it. So there is, all, there is this dynamic as well that we really need to understand. So going forward, I, you know, I, I really believe we need to get to scale and to impact. And this is, these are not just words. So for all of us in this room and for everyone who works in development, and we are very hard on ourselves internally right now, to not just do yet another pilot or to not just replicate something that did really well, but actually only reaches a fraction of the people that you could reach if you would have done something different. I think that we need to be very deliberate to understand, are we reaching a maximum number of people? If we invest a billion dollars, do we get the maximum impact on resilience? Uh, and we haven't done this. We are not doing it systematically. Uh, we're doing it now more in agriculture, for instance, food security. Uh, we're doing it more in water. And I just encourage all of you in, in, in transport and, and, and in that sector to just be really hard on yourself and say, OK, if I had five things I could do, what would they be and why? And then put serious money behind it and get the political economy that's always between us and, and speed and scale and success and impact. Get that up to the level of the minister or above. Get it into the president's office, et cetera, and push it and move it. And we've seen quite a number of very successful cases. And I'm sure the panelists here will share with us uh, in, in, in this next session some of the successes. Because nothing is better than when someone in one country says, you know, we had massive issues. But you know what we did? That actually worked. And you know why it worked. And you know why we cut through the political economy. And you know how we did the financing package. Nothing is more powerful than that. 
So the more we hear of good examples, of course, also those that failed, they need to be shared. There's no doubt about that. But the most powerful one is, is one where you say, nobody believed it was possible, but you know what? It happened. And this is how it happened. And that's, that's what learning is all about. So I wish everyone, like uh, Axel earlier, great week, great success. And I hope we can get to a world where our infrastructure is safe and because that's the foundation for every growth, all the future for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Jürgen, for starting off this plenary, looking at resilient transport in challenging times. Uh, I'm going to ask you, speakers, about the challenging times and why your transport needs to be resilient by sharing examples with us. Uh, Christine showed me boulders on a highway yesterday. She's like, see, this is happening right now. This is what I have to deal with. Christine, will you explain for our audience, for you in Armenia, why there are boulders coming down onto the roads and why that is a good example of resilience and what you're having to do about that. Thank you. Actually, it's happening even today morning. So it's happening every day in our transport, in our infrastructure, in main highways. And uh, we acknowledge and following the monitoring temperature increase, we found out that Armenian overall is sensitive uh, to natural disasters, including earthquakes, landslides, uh, rock falls happening with us very frequently. And uh, this alarming us to understand the full impact, full impact of climate change. And uh, we focus and uh, our focus shifting from reactive responses to proactive mitigation measures uh, in order to identify the sensitive parts and uh, for the uh, network and uh, do the investment, prioritize investment in transport sector. Our good is, example is collaboration with World Bank. Uh, we mapping the climate and uh, disaster hazards uh, with the section of uh, in, in, in a road network. And now we decided to extend this exercise, exercise uh, with uh, in, uh, including whole country, entire country. And um, we're starting with risk assessment and preparation of investment uh, strategy to mitigate uh, this risk on, on a, because Armenia is very dependent on transportation. So major part of transportation, 80% of uh, transportation through the roads, because we have low capacity on the rails and our economy and life being very much uh, depends for ma major part of regions. The roads are lifeline roads uh, for the people. So we're very vulnerable and we will continue our efforts in this direction. I love the way you said reactive proactive because my you nodded like that was a definite i get that why did you nod articulate the nod okay thank you femi uh good morning everyone okay that's uh related to the transportation resilience in indonesia also that's uh indonesia is one of the vulnerable country due to the climate change, flooding, and so on. But also in Indonesia, the most problem actually now is uh, in the urban area, especially in the big cities in Indonesia, such as Jakarta, is the traffic jam, traffic congestion. This, this is uh, very costly. And because of this, uh, one of the government priority for this one to more proactive is how we to provide the public transportation more and more, not in terms of the quantity, but also in terms of the quality. The quality, it means for the sustainable transportation. Sustainable, we call sustainable transportation, it means for the safety and also more green transportation. But how to provide this one is also not as, as easy because, you know, uh, developing the transportation infrastructure is, uh, we need a lot of, of money for sure. A lot of, of the uh, how to finance this one and then uh, how to accelerate for this kind of the provision for sure uh, to accelerate the transportation infrastructure in Indonesia uh, we try to get more investment so 
in Indonesia, especially for me, for me, uh, I'm in touch of the Center for the Transportation Infrastructure Financing. It means we try to get more investment, how to accelerate the development of transportation infrastructure. So this one are uh, not only from the local investment, but also from the abroad uh, foreign investment. This is one of the priority to make, we call Indonesia this one with the creative financing. How to create the creative financing to develop the, to accelerate the development of the transportation infrastructure, more green, more environmental friendly. And also we call this one with the, not the in term of the creative financing inside, we have the green financing because uh, we also think about the sustainable of the transportation. I think this is uh, one of the big things of the Indonesia we face on currently uh, in the big cities uh, in Indonesia because Indonesia is more no, it's more developed in many areas in Indonesia, not only in Jakarta, many big cities in Indonesia. And also we try to uh, more resilience for the climate change issue that one. Thank you. Um, Sissy, in, in your line of work, resilience means what? What preparation are you doing for resilience in transport? Explain with an example, if you would. Sure. I, I think resilience means different things to each each person here. Um, so for uh, what we call lifelines or distributed networks like transportation, uh, resilience has many uh, components, one of which um, is redundancy. So what we have seen after extreme events, and I can talk about a very recent earthquake that happened in Japan a couple of uh, months ago and the devastating earthquake in Turkey last year. Uh, they, all the effects were uh, became much worse because of climate conditions. What we saw is that there was flow of traffic because there was partial ability of the highway network systems to work or not work and this is where problems appeared. So um, a resilient network for transportation is a network that could at least provide key uh, functions to operate because eventually transportation serves the community. So you may have a perfect hospital after a flood, but if you cannot get to it, then you don't have a resilient community. So um, uh, going back to our um, keynote, uh, I think that uh, to build resilience infrastructure, you need to get out of each one of us. Uh, I come from the engineering side, right? Each, each one of us has to get out of our comfort zone and see what we need to get to a goal to a resilient community. Um, so they, they, this comes together with how you finance it, but also how you explain in, in different ways why we should invest in this and how much and when in, and into what stages. What has worked for you from that perspective? So you're kind of laying out, this is how you do it. What has worked? I like the way that Jürgen, he kind of gave us a challenge. Don't keep talking about how hard it is. Tell us how you did it. Right. So um, the way to do it is to change your mindset one, once you're designing or retrofitting or planning. So typically what we do is we say, oh, this is the, the flood that I expect that gives a, a, a force on the system and I will design for it. Now we need to think more big picture and go from that mindset to having decision support system. So we should be able to understand the network, uh, where we have the tools, what are the, the traffic conditions and what could happen to this network and have um, sophisticated tools that we are developing that can give us what are the risk in terms of not just physical losses and not just money losses, but also delays, interdependencies, exposure to cascading uh, events, and find optimal solutions for questions like, I have X amount of money, 
for a year. What is the best way to invest it now, considering also clim climate effects? Or I want to maximize the efficiency of the network. How much money do I need and for how long in order to achieve that? So it is also a stakeholder and a decision maker conversation for the technocrats to be able to apply that. So in the United States, we have a trillion dollar funding for infrastructure, like one third of it goes to transportation. If we go and we dump all this money the same way we were doing it before, we are losing the race against time. We need to invest wisely and invest it with specific goals that can change over time and should follow the life cycle of these assets because a lot of them are aged. We are not all going and building new highways, especially in this country, but I'm sure uh, around the world. We need to use what we have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I fully, sorry, fully agree with this statement of changing mindset. It's true. And uh, why? what we do with it, we understand that we need a new generation of civil engineers and of experts with critical knowledge of climate resilience. And our academic partnership with Oxford Infrastructure and Analytics and our National University of Architecture and Construction aims to uh, promote this knowledge and we trying to invest in, uh, in this uh, to changing mentality, not only within, within governmental authorities, but also creating the new strategies and investment planning, but also to be well prepared in a sense of changing mentality and our attention and our reaction on climate change, because the situation really climate change uh, issues are more fastened than we expecting. Mm -hmm. Really, Louisa, go ahead. What's on your mind? Thank you very much. And, and thank you for coming me here, having me here, because um, I represent the railway sector specifically in, in, in Spain. I totally agree with what you said, because I think in the last years it's so clear how climate uh, change is affecting our transport uh, infrastructure that I think new civil engineers, for sure, they, they will have to take it in, into account with the new designs. But not only with the new designs, I think that maybe the most important are the existing infrastructures and how it is affecting because in the railway system, most of the conventional lines were built at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So the circumstances and the climate events are so different that for sure we have to be much better prepared or differently prepared as, as you said. So let me... I'll explain a little bit about Spain. In Spain, uh, the climate change is affecting us very, very much. We are having um, a much heater uh, summers than before. And uh, speaking about uh, heat waves, um, maybe uh, just 10 years ago, uh, you could speak about, okay, a couple of uh, heat waves in the summer. That means uh, twice for three, four days, maybe 40 degrees on the south of the country. Last summer, media spoke about six, seven waves. I personally think we only had one wave, which started at the beginning of July and finished almost at the end of August, and uh, uh, with um, uh, temperatures over 40 degrees, not in the south of the country, in the north of the country. So the risk of uh, fires and the kind of fires we are having is quite high. And also um, uh, firefighters, uh, they realize that they need different ways of fighting against uh, these kind of fires. But at the same time, we are having uh, severe flooding, um, uh, more frequent and overall in different places than before. And before the minister from Chile, he said that they had an extraordinary flood and he said the biggest in the last 100 years, but who knows if it's going to repeat in a couple of years. So uh, it's very difficult because all the data we used to have before now maybe are not uh, useful. Uh, this is the big disadvantage. I think we at the same time have a big advantage is technology. Now, how can we deal with data? 
So if uh, what we are doing in, in Spain is taking all those data and uh, um, having a, 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 all the information we get from the existing uh, network and uh, um, assessing this data. So we, we can prevent where the most uh, exposed points are and so uh, act uh, on them. And also I think it's, it's quite important not only to plan it, but to collaborate with all uh, shareholders and stakeholders. Uh, some examples we have uh, developed in Spain, for so example, collaborating with um, uh, landowners on both sides of the track and uh, agree with them in some cases to plant uh, trees, for example, just to retain uh, the terrain uh, to, uh, to run. In other cases, sometimes uh, using herbicides uh, to avoid having uh, some uh, vegetation on both sides uh, with the risk of uh, strong fires. So I think collaborating, cooperating with them is quite interesting. And uh, what we are trying to do, what we have already done with the high-speed network, which is more, to, more modern, and so we already have uh, the um, a risk map uh, and uh, it's incorporated in the uh, risk map of the whole company. I mean, the risk map for, for climate change. And now we are doing uh, the same with conventional lines and we are planning to have it finished by 2030. Marilisa, really, can I just take it one step back? Because I was in Europe last summer and I remember the, the weather maps. You know, the deep orange color is when it's super hot. And basically the whole of Spain, a big chunk of Europe, which is the deep burnt orange color. What does that do to the railways in Spain? Well, uh, the advantage of railways is that uh, it is a um, um, mean of transport, uh, more people, more goods. But if it is affected, it affects to more uh, people, more goods. That's why we have to pay attention and not only, as you said before, not only to act afterwards, we have to try to prevent. That's why we're doing this map, risk map, because if you know where the, the most critical points, uh, you, uh, where you have them, you can act on them before that happen. Or maybe it happens once, but uh, uh, avoid to have it uh, twice. For example, uh, last September, there was a very, very, very strong storm in an area on south of Madrid, and it affected to all infrastructures, I mean, roads and railways. And for the first time, it affected to the high-speed railway. But the advantage we had was that in some hours, the high-speed line could uh, again work, and railways um, went back to, to service before then roads. I, I think that's the advantage of uh, railways in these cases. Mm. I see your questions. I need to get an, some insights from Colombia, first of all, from Maria Constanza, and I'll come right back to your questions. Maria Constanza, our entire reason for being here over the, next, over the past two days has been mobilizing finance for climate action. In Colombia, when you're looking at resilience in the transport system, where is that investment coming from? Bueno, contarles antes de Before I talk about investment, allow me to share about the situation in Colombia today. This is not very different from the examples you have shared. Colombia has high vulnerability. I was thinking right now, uh, but, and I was remembering in January, last January, we had an avalanche 39 deaths with this event. During the La Nina phenomenon, we had over 4,700 infrastructure emergencies. So when we are asked, what are the priorities for the Colombian government? If we have five priorities, one of them is today at, is to adapt our infrastructure to climate change how to make infrastructure resilient because we cannot invest in infrastructure if we cannot guarantee that 365 days of the year that infrastructure will be available. As we've said before, infrastructure means development. The economy is based on our infrastructure. And we have a paradigm here. What has Colombia? Done. And this is a path we followed hand in hand with the World Bank and the IDB. We've thought of a new design paradigm 
for years we've talked about green guidelines in design from conception, from feasibility studies, and design infrastructure has to answer taking into account these climate events, which are increasingly frequent and intense. As was said before, maybe this is more costly at the beginning. Maybe it is more expensive if we just look at this simply considering the capex for this type of project. But certainly when we do a comprehensive assessment and if we think about risks and if those risks materialize, we can have a very positive cost benefit ratio. What decisions has the Colombian government taken? Well, we have implemented new design paradigms. This is not an option. Infrastructure has to be thought of in such a way that it is resilient. As I said before yesterday, uh, the, at a different session, characteristics of Colombia are quite specific. We have a mountain range where we see most of the disasters and events. Funding is a challenge, of course, in a country that today still needs to improve connectivity conditions, a country that wishes to reactivate its modes of transport, a country where we see serious needs vis-a-vis -vis urban passenger transport. But we need to find that financing the national government with green funds and everything that is available today through investment banking so that no matter what, we can adapt our infrastructure. In our case, this is an urgent need so as to be able to save lives. And allow me to add something else with this resilience exercise, there is another important concept. Yesterday, we talked about road safety. This is another priority when we mentioned the five priorities for Colombia, saving lives is one of them. And infrastructure also plays a role. And I believe there is a very significant concept. It's this forgiving infrastructure. How can, we ha how can we think of this urban infrastructure, resilient infrastructure, infrastructure that will forgive the mistakes we make when we move throughout the cities so as to cut down on the number of fatalities on the road? This is something that we are working towards and we need to prioritize this. It's been five years that we have been working to understand the location of the emergencies with heat maps so as to prioritize our investments, working also with academia, with new generations of engineers, with training of engineers, so that all of these elements to consider risk do not take us to linear designs. It's not about that anymore, 30 meters here, 30 meters there. We need to understand the permeability of our road and guaranteeing that permeability so that the infrastructure can truly be adapted to the effects of climate change today with these increasingly intense events that put at risk not only infrastructure, but also human life. To do my best to preserve your breaks, I'm going to ask if you would do a brief question and very brief responses from our speakers. Thanks for your patience. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jeremy Anderson uh, from the International Transport Workers Federation. And as we represent 20 million transport workers globally, my question to the panel is, are you including planning for workforce resilience and financing for workforce resilience in your resilience planning? Uh, because transport workers are facing many resilience challenges from heat stress, 
uh, to loss of income, like we saw the extreme economic hardship, for example, in Pakistan after the floods to the rail sector. And we heard from, earlier from Jürgen about the need for urgency. We can't move anywhere if we don't have the workers on board. That is a really good question. I'm going to ask, um, uh, let me just think who is from governments here. Uh, Christine, very briefly, are you thinking about workers in your resilience planning? Well, it's uh, continuing efforts in this regard uh, relating to uh, pro improving capacity overall in, uh, in, in the transport sector, not only uh, as well as for the workers as well. So uh, many trainings and programs developing by the by our ministry in collaboration with MD, M, uh, IFIs uh, to be well prepared and have this expanded knowledge for the workers as well. So we have specific requirements under civil work contracts uh, that needs to prepare also the workers. Let's get a perspective from Indonesia. Mai, is this a new idea or are you already thinking about workers? Yes, uh, I think I, this is uh, similar to Christine. That's in Indonesia, we also have like the special training for the workers and also uh, in terms of the climate issue and so on. So I think this uh, we are thinking for the workers also. So we have to prepare for that one. Yeah. Maria Luisa. If you let me about uh, railways. Uh, the, these uh, high temperatures in summer uh, that has made us to reschedule our works because in general summer was a great period for working uh, for civil works and uh, track works but now with these extreme temperatures thinking about our staff we have to reschedule a, a lot of works so yes we necessarily need to uh, to think about them there's more christine yeah, if I may, uh, the major programs, infrastructure projects coming with health and safety specific programs that have to cover all this risk and uh, provide the measures. That's 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 something mandatory. The contractors and employers, everyone have to follow that. That is such a good question. That question is a thirty-minute panel, right? <laughs> Actually, it's a forty. Yeah, next year. Can can we like? Remember that in that little survey that comes out at the end of the conference, will you put that in? Because the worker is such an important part, point that you made and we're not doing it justice, but I would love to do a worker's plenary. All right, action that. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm François yeah. Daven from International Union of Railways. Yeah. So the question was a little bit for the for the keynote. He said we didn't uh, really um, uh, expect that the climate change effect will be so harsh. I a little bit wonder who is we, because a lot of people expected that the effect of climate change will be as hard as it is today. Perhaps not some people in World Bank, I don't know. But uh, my question is now for, for the panel, do you think you will have enough money because we didn't have enough money to really struggle against carbon emission. It's basically a failure. Do, we, do you think you will have enough money for doing the resilience? Thank you. All right, I'm going to thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to make this a one sentence answer because your one sentence is standard between refreshments and conversation and the break. All right. I have a first volunteer. Please go ahead. Maria Constanza. I believe it is very important to think in terms of priorities and understand what it is we are facing when we talk about climate change and resilience. We're thinking about lives. This is not just about improving a service or improving quality or having greater connectivity. We are truly talking, and this is the case of Col in Colombia, each emergency can mean loss of life, human life. When we try to incorporate these elements, we face certain issues. If we design a bridge with resilience parameters, with green guidelines, this infrastructure will have a longer life. 
uh, ser muy if I may, just to get to the heart of that question in a sentence so we can wrap up our plenary. Will you have, do you have enough money? We have to find it. The investment cannot be cut. We need to find the money. I like that positivity. Christine, your sentence. Sorry, I, no, I, I've, I've, I've not to respond. I just um, want to ask another question. I have not in the line, but it's... Christine, you are sure. making... It, it's a yeah. one sentence if you're going to ask yeah. because no. we are wrapping up. <laughs> All right, your one um, sentence, your, your final sentence. You're leaving us with what? Yeah, I would like to ask about how technologies and data analytics supporting climate-related changes for the other countries and if they have some small experience to share. All right, very good. This is our coffee break conversation. <laughs> Sissy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody has enough money, but the money that we have, we need to spend them wiser and spend them gradually and with priorities, of course, of life safety, but also of life quality, getting um, indicators that relate to how much our design and solutions contribute to reducing climate change impacts on that infrastructure. And that way our money is gonna pay off a lot more while we are trying to solicit more and actually okay. they're gonna bring success cases to make the case for bringing more money. Got it, my. Yes, uh, do we have money? For sure, not enough the money. Mm. I think this almost all us uh, have the similar answer. All right. But how we come up with this one? Yes, uh, how to accelerate the development of the infrastructure and so on. At the first, at the beginning, we are already involved about the, we thinking about the res resilience. So it can be a little bit costly, as uh, the keynote also already mentioned, but I think it's this more sustainable and then in the long term, this is can be cheaper. So from where? The money is from the investment? from you, from all over the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maria Luisa, you have the final words. Yes, now let me, instead of speaking uh, in the name of a Spanish Railways Infrastructure Manager, speaking in the name of all European infrastructure managers, uh, and give me um, uh, give you some, some information. Uh, the European Union published the report on climate change recently, and they said that even though investments in critical sectors, among them is transport, have increased in the last years, uh, for example, in 2022, it's reached uh, 407 billion euros, they say we need uh, still to double, and they calculate more or less 813 billion euros per year, to adapt our infrastructures to uh, make them more resilient. Thank you so much. We have started a conversation. We will continue it the rest of TT 2024. Plenary number four. Attendees, please thank them.